I'm usually pretty open about where I hunt, but this place is a secret. It's a fairy tale piece of public land, an island of wilderness surrounded by corn and soybean fields. Inside, it's a haven for wildlife that I've hunted for rabbits, squirrels, and wood ducks. And I even have a secret spot within my secret spot, just a few acres in size that I've discovered holds woodcock this time of year. They've flushed at my feet while I've bushwhacked the ponds to hunt wood ducks, and this year, I'm chasing woodcock specifically. I don't have a hunting dog or access to one for this hunt, so things will be a little extra difficult without a dog to point to them or flush them. The first bird flushes just a couple minutes into hunting and takes me by surprise. I don't have too clear of a shot, but it happens so fast that I still instinctively take a shot. Unfortunately, this one got away, but now I'm feeling confident that there will be more birds in this spot, and now I'm really ready. I'm using a 12 gauge over and under shotgun, my only shotgun. I find that it may not always be the perfect shotgun for the job, but it's the most well-rounded one for me, and only shooting one gun makes you pretty comfortable shooting it. Generally, a 12 gauge is pretty overkill for hunting such a small bird, but I'm using a small shot size with a fairly low velocity to try to minimize meat damage. After all, in the end, maximizing the yield from anything I kill is always my goal. Woodcock are such a unique bird, one that I've never eaten before, one that I guess the majority of Americans have never even seen before, maybe even heard of, but these are actually highly revered amongst people in the know. Finally, a clear shot. I take it, and I immediately see the bird falling, and while it's still in the air, the panic of trying to find such a small and well camouflaged bird in such thick vegetation begins to rise within me. Before the bird even hits the ground, I mentally mark where the bird flushed, where it was in the sky when I took the shot, the trajectory the bird was flying in, and the expected point of impact on the ground. This isn't just good practice, but necessary when hunting without a dog to sniff out the bird. You always want to be able to return to where you took the shot and point out exactly where the bird was falling towards. As I make my way over the ridge where I should find the woodcock, I see slight movement. The bird is mortally hit, but hasn't yet expired. In a way, it's a blessing to give its position away to me, but of course, I'd rather it be dead before it even hits the ground to reduce suffering as much as possible. I take a follow-up shot to make sure it doesn't get away, but also to end any suffering. I don't think anyone could come out at a calorie surplus hunting these little birds because of how much effort it takes to find them in their preferred habitat, but it's rewarding and takes you into areas that you'd never venture without a good reason. It really is probably the toughest hunting per pound of meat I've ever experienced. As with any successful harvest, there's the exhilarating climax to finding the game animal that is also dampened by the death of an animal. Then the excitement of being able to prepare a brand new type of meat that I've never been able to taste before hits. After a while, it becomes difficult to find a brand new type of meat to try, and I feel a bit like a junkie chasing a new and better high in my search for new meats with new flavors to offer. I can't tell you how sad I am just for this one little bird. And it takes a lot of work busting through all this junk. So excited. It's 
so excited. For my first attempt at cooking a new wild game meat, I like to go with a somewhat simple recipe from a wild game cook that I trust. For a new game bird, simple means roasted, and trusted wild game cook means Hank Shaw. The recipe I'm trying is almost entirely from his incredible cookbook, Pheasant Quail Cottontail, with one very significant alteration that I took the liberty to adapt due to a chance find in the woods, a puffball, which is a great neutral mushroom that I'm incorporating into the dish rather than using toast as Hank suggests. Like most game birds that I harvest, I'm plucking this bird in order to enjoy as much of the bird as possible. However, I admit I'm not quite as adventurous as some. One technique is to pluck but not gut the bird and cook it whole. Supposedly, the bird effectively clears out its bowels whenever it takes flight, so the entire innards can theoretically be enjoyed. But I admit, this is a bit much for me for my first go at cooking woodcock. I'm happy to collect and eat the typical offal, just not the intestines at this point. Who knows what the future holds though. Give a little close up. Huge beak. Yeah. Get those earthworms. And they're worm eaters. Yeah. Yes, they are. Let's see how it looks. It's pretty small. <laughs> Very small. I'm starting with the fully plucked and gutted woodcock. Liver and heart have been kept for a future terrain, feet are frozen to add to a future stock for their gelatin, and the wings unfortunately were too damaged by shot to keep, not to mention how small they are. I am for the most part following Hank Shaw's method and recipe for roast woodcock, which you can read up on by following the link in my description. My goal is to show how I went about it in my own little twist. While not terribly important, I'm trusting the legs together to keep things a little bit more compact and controlled. I'm also deciding that the small neck is better off for the stock pot than for keeping on for roasting. I'm using a cast iron skillet as a roast pan. First, I'm cooking up some bacon. This is actually more to render some smoky drippings to see the woodcock in than for the actual bacon, although we will use some to shield the breast from some of the direct heat when roasting as well. Take it off before it actually crisps. Quickly sear as much of the outside of the bird as possible over medium high heat, but don't sear the breast. We want to keep this part from cooking to as high of a temperature as the rest of the bird. Then, turn off the heat and use some celery to keep the bird breast side up with bacon slices draped over the breast. Then, it's going into a 500 degree oven for about 5 minutes. Meanwhile, I'm going to try to get a single thick slice from the center of my puffball that I forged. The meat of the mushroom should be perfectly pure white to be eaten. The mushroom will gradually turn brown from the inside out, so the outer slices should be the freshest part to take. You can see it almost looks like a dense bread, or almost a dried tofu that is springy to the touch. I'm going to sear it in a knob of butter like it would cook a grilled cheese in a pan. After just a couple minutes, it picks up a beautiful color that really could pass for toast. I'm just going to hold it aside now while I finish everything else up. The bacon comes off the breast now, but we'll continue to cook the woodcock while we make a Cumberland sauce, which Hank is pretty firm is the best choice. Zest one lemon and one orange with a zester to leave behind the pith, which can contribute unwanted bitterness. Then, mince a shallot and begin to fry them in the same pan that the puffball cooked in. 
After they are translucent, I'm adding about a half cup of port wine to deglaze the pan. Port is such an awesome component to big, rich sauces. There's a decent amount of sugar in them, balanced by a high alcohol content and the usual wine acidity. After scraping up the fond, I'm using about a quarter cup of frozen glass de viande, essentially super concentrated stock that adds tons of flavor and silkiness to any sauce. Mine is made from duck stock, however any dark glass de viande or boiled down stock would work fine. Then season with salt, add the zest and combine, followed by an addition of dry mustard and cayenne pepper. The spiciness from the pepper is a bit odd at first, but it brings out a more interesting flavor. After reducing down just a bit, we add our lingonberry jam with a big dose of sweetness and tartness similar in profile to the port wine. I like having the actual fruit in the jam for a bit of a rustic feel. After adding a bit of black pepper, taste and adjust the seasoning as necessary. Around this time, the smoke alarm should let you know that the woodcock is done roasting since the bacon grease is beginning to smoke. Or maybe your timing is just perfect. Remove the bird and check for doneness, but remember that like many game birds, you're not wanting to cook it well done like chicken. Now we're ready to assemble. Preferably using a shallow, indented plate, pour some of the Cumberland sauce to cover the bottom. Then, our mushroom slice to support the woodcock over the sauce. Finally, a sprinkle of fleur de sel. And now for the moment of truth. I have a fork and knife, but I'm pretty sure this is gonna end up being finger food. Start with the breast meat. That is such a rich flavor. It's reminiscent of duck meat. Now, I'm gonna try the leg. It's so weird having white meat on the leg, dark meat on the breast. A little of the sauce. Definitely a completely different flavor. The white meat here. Super mild flavor like rabbit or chicken. I didn't even try a mushroom yet. That's like butter. It's really good. Never again will I pass up a puffball. It's a good pairing. I can't wait to go woodcock and chicken again. One, one is hardly enough. It's a beautiful, wild, and masculine dish with so many layers of super deep flavors. Pair with a barrel-aged stout, your brown spirit of choice, Malbec, or maybe even finish the meal with a cigar. If you liked this video, please hit that like button and please subscribe.